All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm Dr. Christy Smurl, and today we're going to be having a discussion on what's called supramental consciousness. So for those of you who may not know me or who are new to me, um, like I said, I'm Dr. Christy Smurl, and I am doing a Healthier Vibrations podcast today with our guest, Craig Williams. Welcome, Craig. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me back on. Nice. So I just want to go over a little bit of introduction. So my background, I've studied in Ayurveda. I got my doctorate in Ayurveda, so I'm really interested in different subjects regarding conscious development. And in addition, I'm an advanced yoga teacher trainer. And so I'm always looking over different texts and seeing what I can learn. And I've come across some new information in the last couple of years that really have sparked my curiosity. So I wanted to have Craig with us today to discuss this concept of supramental consciousness. And let me give you just a little bit of background on Craig. So not only is he well studied in Eastern and Western religions, he's also an ordained bishop. And if you haven't caught our other discussions in podcasts on interesting subjects, I strongly recommend you do. So you can go to healthiervibrations.com and access the information via blog or podcast or YouTube, or you can go to his website also at austinariveda.com. Okay, so I just want to jump right into the subject today and not too many formalities. So for those of you joining at home, if you have a question at any time, just type it into the chat box and then we'll try to get that integrated. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the concept of supramental consciousness. So what I really want to do is just start off with some reading. So the first time I was introduced to this concept, it was reading Sri Aurobindo, the integral yoga book. So I just want to start off setting the picture by reading. So this is chapter three, and it's titled Planes of Consciousness and Parts of the Being, the Evolution of Consciousness. In my explanation of the universe, I have put forward this cardinal fact of a spiritual evolution as the meaning of our existence here. It is a series of ascents from the physical being and consciousness to the vital, the being dominated by life itself, to the mental being realized in the fully developed man, and thence into the perfect consciousness, which is beyond the mental into the supramental consciousness and the supramental being, the truth consciousness, which is the integral consciousness of the spiritual being. So, it's a lot of stuff. Sri Aurobindo <laughs> is sometimes a difficult read. We but, can talk about that. Right. Can you give us some background on this concept of supramental consciousness and some of Sri Aurobindo's writings on it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to touch on that. I mean, one of the most fundamental issues with Sri Aurobindo is, is typically accessibility. Um, his work is extremely dense. It's extremely verbose. However, it's also extremely full of important details. It's a gold mine of information for practitioners of yoga, practitioners of Ayurveda. Um, and, he, and I would say without a doubt, he was probably the most important figure in contemporary, you know, yogic culture, without a doubt. Um, his poet, his poem Savitri, for example, is one of the most important esoteric texts written of all time. Um, you could spend an entire lifetime in sadhana just on Savitri alone. Um, and I grew up studying Aurobindo. He's always been a big inspiration to me. And Aurobindo is also really fascinating because he really is this unique expression of a true integration of Eastern and Western studies. 
um, because it's very important to remember Aurobindo was not raised in an Indian culture. When he was younger, his father sent him to English schools uh, to basically almost, that was during the time when the British colonialism was very heavy and his father wanted him to be uh, not an Indian. So he was trained extensively in Latin and Greek, all the classics of Western culture. And then in his 20s and, or teens and 20s, he started to realize, oh, I have this other heritage. So he went back to India and embraced his natural heritage. So he truly is a syncretic vision. And we talk about that a lot, but he truly, truly is that. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. He was also a radical political figure in his youth. He fought uh, ex extremely hard for Indian independence. Um, and he was not shy at all about being quite political and controversial about that. He was jailed for a time being. We can touch upon his visions in jail of Krishna, which are quite fascinating. But he developed a system of what he called integral yoga. And this was a system of yoga which actively sought to bring about a total evolution in humanity right now. It was not seeking to escape the world. It was not seeking to be the yogi living in the mountains far away from everybody. It was seeking to actually create a certain space which was conducive to bringing down the Shakti, the divine Shakti on this planet in the body, in the flesh, and to transform every aspect of culture in that way, um, which he referred to as the supramental descent. So his integral yoga was a system which he sought to teach people um, how to actively uh, take part in this evolution. And it's a quite an inspiring idea. So, so fundamentally, I would say it's different from this idea of this, of this yoga being this type of escapism from the body uh, to turn off all the senses and go inside and leave the body behind. He, his yoga was not that, although he was, ex he was trained in that. And you can access all his journals, which he talks about his yogic techniques. But what he sought was to kind of awaken the inner Agni, transform the body, transform the mind, transform the emotions, and then call down the divine mother. Um, and then he developed a very unique vocabulary for all this, right? That's why we're here talking about this. Mm -hmm. He created extremely unique vocabulary and extremely like a linguistic expression of his sadhana. Uh, and so you kind of have to learn a little bit about that. You know, he, he, he often refers to, he breaks down consciousness into this idea of the super mind, the over mind, then it goes into the mind and then it goes into the earth. And so it's kind of a descent of consciousness and the, the super mind, which is where we get this relation to the supra mental consciousness is basically the vast overall cosmic mind. Um, and that's where we're kind of, we're all, or I would, we could say it's the cosmic sun, you know, and we're all sparks from that cosmic sun coming down here. And so he was seeking to use his integral yoga just to awaken ourselves, kind of clear away the Maya, uh, clear away the avidya, and that once we realized that we were divine beings, that was the first step, which is essentially what we talked about in one of our last podcasts was about awakening Agni. That once you would, that was awakened, you would start to develop your own personal evolution. And as that was happening, which is a, a type of an ascent, right? It's almost like the Kundalini that goes up the spine. There is a little bit of that going on, but he was very clear in saying with the ascent, there must be a descent as well. It has to be a very alchemical thing where two forces are coming together to meet um, together. And that's what had to happen, his integral yoga. So we can talk about some of his terms, which get confusing to people. Um, his, his material is very dense, but it's not complicated if, we, if you just kind of talk about it and you learn the terms. Yeah, I was reading in one of the descriptions that he talked about the supermental transformation giving rise to a new individual right or in one of the things i read the gnostic being is yes. what it was termed yes he really I, I love this phrase of the gnostic being and that that's always been a big influence on my work and my writings and and the, and the idea of that we're not seeking to eradicate the ego we're not seeking to destroy the self it was more a purification uh, and a transformation, and uh, and also I would say an illumination. So it's a purification, a transformation, an illumination 
that's going on within the egoic being so that you can be aware of your transformation so that you can take part in the transformation and the evolution in, in full awareness. And then once that happens and you can start to experience the new self, because he was quite radical. I mean, his, his idea was that, that we would see a, a transformation on a cellular level, on, on, an, on an emotional level, on a psychological level. Uh, and that would happen where the Atman or the soul would start to literally radiate out of every part of the flesh and being. And when that happened, it wasn't a destruction of the ego. It was just a purification of the ego. Um, which actually is quite, quite close to the Vaishnava idea of Achencha Beta Beta Vada, um, which is the idea of the simultaneous unity and difference at the same time. That there's not a, an eclipse of the personality, that you're not just being dissolved back into nothingness. You're actually keeping a distinct part of your consciousness while you commune with the super mental, um, which is a paradox, right? It's a very mysterious idea. But that, it was very, very similar to that. He just was really radical in, in developing his own ideas. And then, he, of course, he was, it was a beautiful balance with the mother. When Mira and him came together, the mother was able to soften a lot of these messages and bring it out in a different way and carry on the work uh, for that way, um, which is incredibly important. And he, she was like the Shakti to his kind of, you know, really heady ideas. And so people can access Aurobindo's work you know, directly through him. If they have trouble with that, then I always tell them to start with the teachings of the mother and then work their work, you know, via that way as well. That's really interesting because, you know, what you're talking about earlier, you were discussing how one of the things is to truly radiate the right. um, from the flesh. Right. And I think that a lot of spiritual seekers are always seeking up and away and outside yes. of themselves. Totally and, agree. you know, he talks a lot about divination of the actual being. Literally. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that process? Yeah, that, that was literally his idea was that there would be a complete divinization of mundane reality, and mainly a, a complete divinization of matter. And then once matter was divinized, then it can continue on into its active evolution. You know, he always talked about that nature was always evolving. You know, nature had this consciousness that was always seeking to evolve. But when we spoke about kind of using this intro integral yoga, he would often refer to it as the yoga of nature. He would say that often with that too. So it was very kind of, which of course ties it very closely into Ayurveda about understanding nature. And if we are in harmony with nature, then our prakriti can evolve in the way that it needs to evolve. So we can even see ties to Ayurveda in there clearly. Um, and then you're right, there, it was not an escapism away from the flesh. It was, it was more like a, a, an immersing in the flesh. It's very similar to the Upanishadic idea of the flame hidden in matter. We, we talk, you know, we see many of the Upanishads discuss this. They talk about that the flame was already pre-existing in the matter. It just had to be coaxed out. And they would often say that was coaxed out through the tapas of the sadhana. And, they, and we would get all these metaphors of the two sticks rubbing together, right? One, one stick was the mantra and, and the other stick was the practitioner. And when they were rubbing together, the tapas would create the appearance of Agni. And it seemed like we were doing that, but in reality, Agni was always already there. We were just creating an environment which was allowing it to manifest, um, um, we, which is very Ayurvedic. And it's also very tantric, the idea of that this reality is not necessarily destructive. It's not necessarily oppressive. Um, it's more about our perspective of this reality. Uh, if we're able to kind of wipe away the avidya and peel back the maya, then we can see that, oh, we have the a potential to divinize matter, to transform this world. Um, and when you look at his life, and which is why it's, it can be very important to study his life, um, you can see that, you know, he was, he, he was active in everything. He was active in political, he was active in education, he was active in health, he was active in writing. And then as he aged, as he evolved, as he aged and evolved, then of course that was transforming. He went deeper and deeper into his system. So his life was actually kind of a manifestation of his ideas too. 
So I often encourage people if they're interested in, in Aurobindo um, and they're having a little bit of trouble with, with some of these technical terms, just start looking at his life, study his life. And then with, there's ample readings about that. And then you can really start to see, wow, you know, I can see what's happening. He wasn't just some guy sitting in a cave somewhere. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He was very respectful of sadhus. Um, there was actually, I would encourage people to look at, there's actually a very important uh, spiritual and karmic connection between Sri Aurobindo and Ramana Maharshi. They both deeply respected each other. Um, and they lived very closely in India, they, and they both were totally respectful of each other. And they were, in many ways, this radical balance, because you have Aurobindo with just, just this explosion of information, of everything, and this explosion from the mother of information and everywhere. And then you have Aurobindo, or rather Ramana, who was just complete silence, <laughs> this complete and utter silence and simplicity with his mother living there completely silent. So it was almost as if they were one soul manifesting in two different ways in the, in the motherland of India, which is quite an esoteric idea, but you can totally balance those out, um, the study of those two. That's really interesting. It's an, it's an interesting idea, yeah. It's, and it, there, there's, there needs to be more books written about that. Maybe I'll write some stuff about it one day, but it's really interesting to see those things. Yeah. And I found, you know, you were mentioning that relationship. I wanted to kind of tease out a little bit the relationship between him and who's referred to as the mother. Right. So first I just want to read a little bit. This is one of my favorite books. Oh, it's beautiful. So beautiful. And, you know, it was funny. I was on social media this morning and a memory popped up of this book. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's wonderful. That's fitting. That's so, karma. The very first page, I just want to read it and then, you know, relate it back to the mother and a little bit about who the mother was and some of her history. So this states, there are two powers that alone can affect in their conjunction with the great and the difficult thing, which is the aim of our endeavor, a fixed and unfailing aspiration that calls from below mm. and a grace, a supreme grace from above that answers. But the supreme grace will act only in the conditions of the light and the truth. It will mm. not act in conditions laid upon it by falsehood and the ignorance. For if it were to yield to the demands of the falsehood, it would defeat its own purpose. That's a beautiful verse. And it's the, the first one out of the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it ties in that whole concept of bringing down and yes. raising up. But one thing I found interesting is its discussion right out of the bat about not laying down conditions based in falsehood and ignorance. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's self-defeating. Right. Yeah, that's a great verse because that shows you that like that unflinching intent is Agni. And then the grace that comes down is the, you know, the divine supermental descent. And that's what we're always seeking. You know, we're always seeking that grace. In many ways, that verse kind of sums up bhakti yoga, a pure prima bhakti yoga, uh, in the sense that we're having a clear, sincere aspiration. And then that is causing this mysterious descent of the grace, which is, can be completely unpredictable. Um, and so that's the big thing is that, you know, how are we functioning with, within the Mayak realm? And I also think that verse is a beautiful expression of the importance of Ayurveda. Because as, as we use Ayurveda, we would educate ourselves about our body, educate ourselves about our mind, our relationship to the body-mind, our relationship to nature. And hopefully that would start to give people some tools to clear away that avidya, clear away the falsehoods. Um, and for example, even that's also another important reason why Jyotish comes in, because then Jyotish can start to teach people, give them the tools, their relationship to their karma, uh, the cosmic archetypes we can use to enlighten ourselves, bring in more awakening of the inner sun. And once that happens, then we're not operating within this kind of obsc obscuration or this kind of delusional place. Um, 
So that's a beautiful verse to read. It's, it's, it's packed. That little book is packed with so much information. It is. I wanted to read the, a little bit more from that same passage or mm -hmm. paragraph. It's on page two. These are the conditions of the light and the truth. The soul conditions under which the highest force will descend. And it is only the very highest supramental force descending from above and opening from below that can victoriously handle the physical nature and annihilate its difficulties. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when I was reading that about a year ago, I thought to myself, well, what if you have crappy intentions? Yeah. Does that somehow, how would that come into play as the opening occurs? And will it just result in confusion, delusion, and ridiculous behavior? Yeah, that's typically what you would see. You could even, uh, not to go too occult with that, but you could see clear relationships between that and what uh, Crowley would talk about uh, crossing the abyss. Uh, the, the practitioner, if they if they were attempting to cross the abyss before they were ready, then it was all that all they were going to do was enter into a deeper and deeper falsehood and delusional level. And they and he would say that's when they became a black brother. They were just living in complete delusion or mm -hmm. megalomania or problems like that. So it is a big problem. It is a big concern that someone can get in those delusional levels. And we we see that we can see that with uh, delusional teachers or delusional cults or delusional anything, delusional uh, social movements, you know, they, it, can, it can kind of infiltrate different levels. And we would, from a Aurobindo point of view, we would say that's Asuric, you know, the Asuric beings were kind of causing an obfuscation of the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but even within that, it, it, when you study Savitri, the, the larger text, there, that there's still, um, that's an inherent alchemical tension in this realm is that battle between the Asuric and the, and the Devas. It's kind of, it's kind of built into the structure. So we have to be aware of it. We have to watch for it, but we don't have to be necessarily paranoid about it. Um, you know, that's, that's the symbol of the creation of the, of the earth, you know, with the, the Nagas and the De Asuras and the Devas all working together to create the world. That, that's a very important idea to think about within that. That's always happening in, 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 within our inner selves. It's happening on a cultural level. It's happening on a cosmic level. Uh, and, and so then we have these yugas and sub-yugas where, where, you know, where that's going to be an easier or less easy time based on our accessibility to cosmic, the cosmic sun, the prana of the cosmic sun. So it's a struggle. It's always a struggle. That's the, uh, you know, that's why we're always living the Bhagavad Gita, right? <laughs> we're mm -hmm. always living that battle. That's always ongoing, but that you bring up an important point. It still means we should, we should pay attention that we should ask for ad advice and find good teachers and find friends that don't just support our delusions that always help us to be honest with ourselves. Yeah, um, I think that's really important. And, you know, you've, you've mentioned many times before that you, and many references refer to, you have to have a solid teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get a little bit waylaid, I go directly back to my rooted source of a specific teacher who I know will tell me you're full of it, you yes. know, or you, you've kind of fallen off the track or, you know, you've gone a little bit down the wrong road there. And I think that right now, given our adaptation period, Yep. We need to really be conscientious of how we're looking at our sacredness and our method of divinization. Yeah, yeah, totally. I totally agree. Uh, it's always a work in progress. We're always working on it. There's not like a, a there's not like a rule book necessarily, but that's that's kind of the benefit of a of a sadhana, you know, the bit the benefit of a system. Uh, the benefit of a sampradaya, the benefit of community and friendship, uh, that we can help each other, and and, and even uh, even us today, discussing this, is 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 a seeking for that, right? We're having a discussion, trying to see like, hey, let's just discuss these terms that maybe people might be confused on, or let's our discussion. Maybe after this discussion, everyone goes home and thinks, oh, right, okay, part of me was right on about that. Maybe I need to look at this. So we're all we're always working. We're always a work in progress. 
Uh, I think if we remember that, that's the important thing. You know, it's our, our journey is constant with that. I wanted to read a little bit more just out of this Ooh, itsy perfect. bitsy book, which I love. Yeah. It says, there must be a total and sincere surrender. There must be an exclusive self-opening to the divine power. There must be a constant and integral choice of the truth that is descending, a constant and integral rejection of the falsehood of the mental, vital and physical powers and appearances that still rule the earth nature. Mm. And you know, when I read through that, I thought, you know, how much of this is, and, and I know that's tied in with, you know, the concept of surrender and Ishvara Pranidhana and, yes. you know, tapas and saucha kept coming to mind, you know, that mm -hmm. cleanliness, that cleanliness of your intent, that yeah. cleanliness of your motivation, the cleanliness, you know, we talked in the section on Agni last podcast about, you know, cleanliness of the body. Otherwise you have toxins within your physical system, within yes. the earth element yes. or toxins, even within the shrotas that are causing all of the doshas to become imbalanced. And then right. really, purifying at the level of the mind and this whole process when they talk about dissension and creating the supramental i'm wondering how many people have that descent of shakti or right. manifestation of shakti and really are not prepared for it you know you hear yeah, about yeah. people having kundalini crises yes Yes, yes, yes. And, and manifesting almost as if they have, ins you know, symptoms of insanity yeah. when they're not able to handle the energetic shift. And I think that yeah. that's kind of real important to talk about right now during this adaptation we're going through. That's huge. Yeah. And, you know, I would say this, that you bring up a good point about intention and actions. And, and I would say this from a, an agoric perspective and a tantric perspective that cleanliness of intent is more important than cleanliness of the actions. It's, uh, and I repeat that cleanliness of the intent is more important than the potential cleanliness of supposed actions. Uh, meaning our intentions are more important than temporary morals that fluctuate from culture to culture, depending on who, who's in political power or who has cultural clout or who's going to deep, 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 deep platform this week over the next. The intention is the key. And so that's a big part with that. And that's why we see such radical um, diversity within Hindu culture. We see radical diversity within that. You know, we see everything from sadhanas to people who are extremely immersed in culture. So that's a big thing. But the idea about being prepared for the descent is so important. And that's kind of what we're always seeking to do. And that's, you know, once again, we can go back to Ayurveda, like you were saying, it's like we need to prepare the vessel so that we can take things in in an imbalanced way. And then we can actually use Ayurveda, particularly if we combined Ayurveda, Jyotish, and yoga together, then we have we kind of have a diagnostic system yeah. to, to tell, okay, am I on track? Am I off track? Am I imbalanced? Am I, am I on track but feeling a little tweaked out? You know, you know, we can kind of use that. And I think that's the problem when we take these systems and just, and don't use them in, and to, to use a term, to don't use them in an integral way. <laughs> and then we never have any system of check and balance. And so it's so important. Um, you know, that's why I always try to say, hey, people need to learn about Jyotish, learn about Ayurveda while they're having a spiritual practice. Um, Cause it really helps them just kind of stay in balance, feel more balanced, stay the course, prepare the body and the mind. Uh, and then I think we have to say, People need to be patient, yeah. you know, that we have to have a sincerity of intent. And then we also have to have a patience that there's a beautiful metaphor in the deeper levels, the deeper esoteric levels of bhakti yoga, when they'll say the, pu the purest bhakti is the bhakti that literally doesn't even want enlightenment. All it wants is just to worship. You know, they would say Krishna's most purest devotees don't even want to be enlightened. They don't want anything except just to worship, just to be immersed in that grace. And because most people, you know, we know this, most people do bhakti because they want something and that's totally normal, right? 
we pray because we want this to happen. We are doing this bhakti because we want some kind of peace. Um, so the patience is key. Intention is key. Um, yeah, I, along those lines, I really, you know, I've, I've often had people ask me, you know, why do you chant so much? Mm-hmm, and I mm-hmm. say, why does a child draw a picture for their mom? Yep, 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 it's true. They, they do it out of devotion and out of love. And I think that sometimes when people are really moving into these spiritual practices, and you're talking about using Ayurveda in these different sciences as a diagnostic tool, they don't realize that when their antenna, their physical body, is perhaps deranged or out of balance, that you're not picking up perhaps a clear signal. Yeah. Or if your wiring isn't correctly insulated, or if you're trying to screw in a 120-watt bulb into a 30-watt socket, you're going to yeah. have problems. Yeah. That's, so those analogies are beautiful, and it's a perfect way to think of it. Um, and that's kind of why we always want to you know, be patient and cultivate this, this receptivity. And also, too, you had a great example of that, that, you know, essentially our sadhana should be a spontaneous celebration of our relationship with the cosmic mind. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate what we seek instead of the sadhana being for something or to do something, Um, you know. And that's hard for people to see when they're outside of that um, type of viewpoint. Um, that once you once you kind of deepen and you go into those viewpoints, then it just becomes a natural thing to do. People are outside of that; it looks crazy, which is why we call people. You know, that's why we say, "Oh, they're they're God intoxicated saints, or they're they're drunk on the you know." So they see that they're wild, they're crazy, and, and the, the modern culture sees them as wild and crazy. But to them, they're seeing things that so clear. Um, and they they just can't they can't help but chant or they can't help but sing or they can't help but draw or they can't help but paint. Um, we need more. We definitely need more of that in our in our contemporary culture. Yeah, I agree. Less in the mind. So that reminds me of another section here that I was looking at, and I wanted to bring up. This was. Um, about the supramental descent, and it says the manifestation of the supramental upon earth is no more a promise, but a living fact, a reality. Right. And I think that people have a hard time understanding perhaps that, like we talked about earlier, the goal is not to escape the body, but the goal is to bring the utmost manifestation into physical form right or you know there, there's different terms out there and i don't want to mix them up but there's things like terms like desacralization and yeah, yeah, yeah. um catabasis and yeah, yeah. and i think that from my experience being around different types of cultures and religions we're always reaching up reaching up reaching away or to something else rather than really recognizing like what they taught me in what kindergarten, that it's, it's the flame inside your heart. That's where yeah. it all is. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's important. And, the, and that, that was even the, that's the fundamental basis. Actually everything we're talking about within the Aurobindo system was the deep inspiration of my idea of sacramental vision and entering the desert was that we are we're re-sacralizing the world. We're, re- we're re-sacralizing everything. And that's essentially the supermental descent, just in a word and in a different way. Um, and that's what I, that's the most important thing for us to understand, is, is that that's really what we're trying to do, is we're trying to call that down, call the grace. And also, too, like you said, it's a fact. That's another topic which is consistently expressed in the, the text Savitri, is that it, this will happen. This is going to happen. It's already happening. It's destined to happen. It's just, do you want to be a part of it consciously or not? And then, you know, how much do you want to be that? And then that's kind of like a return of all these sparks of divinity kind of returning to the source uh, in this kind of participating in cosmic evolution, um, which is very powerful, very beautiful. Yeah. It, Sri Aurobindo talked a lot about this, you know, evolution of consciousness and, yes. and a, like a collective change. Yes, yes. Did he ever like give um, 
estimation in time and things like that? Or did he refer to it more like as a continual ongoing process that never changes or he, ends? Yeah, he kind of continued a little bit of both. I mean, he, he was, he actively wanted to see transformation, which, which when you see his life, that's why he was so actively kind of trying to, to push and do things. And him and the mother too, even esoterically behind the scenes were always working to try to transform things as well too. Um, and they would often talk about uh, both in the mother's writings, which are voluminous, and in his writings, which are voluminous, that that, that was very exhausting. You know, their, their, their work was extremely exhausting. They were really trying to push these larger, you know, societal planetary transformations, and it was very hard and taxing on the body. Um, and so that was a, not an easy thing, but they were pushing the the, the limit really hard. So he definitely wanted to try to push it faster as, as fast as he could. But he also understood that that was, he felt that was his role. That was his role at that time to, was to do that. And that everyone else should, well, he wanted everyone to participate into it and start learning about it because then we would have a critical mass, you know, because the, the, the idea of the, the karmic shift is coming. It's like when you look at a Jyotish chart, when you look at someone's chart and you can see uh, maybe a, a new Dasha period is coming and you know, okay, this is going to come. It's going to come. It's, it's inevitable. But when, how awake can you be when this comes will make it happen faster, more efficiently, more integrated. That's the key, I think, to think about that, you know, more in balance as opposed to, you know, just kind of radical change, which just disrupts everything. Uh, and, and it's messy for a while, you know, as opposed to saying, hey, well, maybe we could have this happen in a little more balanced pace and people can understand it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And, you know, it's been very helpful in the past to have my chart looked at to explain, you know, why am I going through yes, this yes. particular phase right now? And when they look at your chart, it's like they're just telling you what's already happening. Yes. And it, it's really interesting yes. to, to help prepare. Right. And you kind of can actively participate then. You're not just a leaf blowing in the wind, wondering what's happening. You know, that's, that's one of the big things with Aurobindo's work is he wanted to really empower people to be active participants in their spiritual evolution, to be active participants in the spiritual transformation of their, of the world, you know. Well, and, you know, I kind of have run across groupings of people that it's kind of not cool to be spiritual, you yes. know, and it's, it's, you know, considered soft or holly hobby, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my opinion, draws people to avenues that are self-destructive. I agree. Yeah. I think we can see that, um, the, you know, I've often said this, some people have trouble with this, but the more, the more secularized we, a uh, society becomes, the more problems you typically see in different ways, because they're, they're searching for some kind of, sp of spiritual source in ways that where there's typically dead ends. And so, you know, they're searching for it in some way, but it's not in a, in a way that's going to give them some, some kind of lasting connection. And of course we have problems with, with uh, organized religion, but we're, what we're talking about is way beyond the problems of organized religion. We're talking about a deeper, true spiritual path. It's, it's above and beyond the problems of, of that. The, 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 the problems of the organized religions are just asuric problems. Those aren't, those aren't spiritual problems. They're, they're problems with the asuric influence within spirituality, just like there's an, a problem with asuric influence in political things, right? Aurobindo was not apolitical. <laughs> Aurobindo was radically political radically political um but he, he spent felt, jail time for his yeah he was, went to jail for it he was they wanted to kill him he was constant his life was constantly in danger when he was younger for his radical viewpoints he was a for example he was a radical opponent of gandhi he absolutely did not agree with gandhi on any level about sitting back and 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 ahimsa he was like no we must fight he would often say arise arjuna we have to fight for mother india there's a time and a place for this. And, and, and so you can really see he was, he was a radical in that way. He definitely was not just like, oh, living in some fantasy land, giving everything up. Now, towards the end of his life, 
he, he retreated, but that was after, and then some, I, I often see people say that and they'll say, well, he was just living in seclusion at the end of his life. But that they don't, they, those people didn't look at the trajectory of his life. You know, that's, that's like looking at a, uh, this is a really bad example, but it's like looking at like a, a professional boxer who, who, when he's in his eighties is not fighting anymore. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're like, of course he's not fighting anymore. He's in his eighties. He's resting. But if you looked at his, his whole life, he was out battling constantly. So Aurobindo was a warrior all his life. And then at the end, when he deepened his spiritual practice and he wanted to really express this radical integral yoga, he did go into retreat. And the, and the mother kind of took over, you know, more and more about that as well at that point. So her expressions were stronger then. Can, can you tell us more about um, the mother or Mira? Yeah, Mira was a really interesting figure. I also think, too, another really beautiful thing, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that Aurobindo was this kind of really unique kind of amalgamation of Eastern and Western karmic streams together. Um, so was Mira. Mira, you know, was, was grew up and... Uh, a Western, you know, European background, and she had very interesting occult studies with very controversial teachers. And then eventually, when she encountered Aurobindo, um, she had had a dream and a vision after reading the Bhagavad Gita and had seen Aurobindo, you know, coming down, uh, kind of seeing him. And then when she saw him in person, she realized, oh, that's what my dream was. That's what my vision was. And so and then eventually they met and started working together and then it exploded from there. So she is very interesting background. She kind of also shows that there was this evolution. Once again, it's beautiful because you, when you look at the mother's life and Mira's life and you look at Aurobindo's life, it just, it's a beautiful expression of just complete evolution of consciousness. You see it happening. You know, you see it happening. It's not just like they were born perfect or they were born this, it was like this beautiful transformation to, that kind of crystallized into who they were. And then it continued to transform even more and more. And then they were only, they were able to transform continuously until the physical body gave out, right? That's, that's kind of what happens. And that's what they were fighting. They were like, yes, we still have to have these transformations. And, and you know, I will say this, some of the most important writings to study, if someone is interested in this, is to study the writings of the mother's last and most important student, which was a French gentleman called Sat Prim. And Sat Prim has some extremely important writings about Aurobindo's work, the mother's work. He stayed with the mother the last years of her life, collected all her, as much writings as she could, and he collected a series, I believe there's about, about 20 volumes called The Mother's Agenda. And they're quite big, and it's just their discussions that he he composed them all down, and, and they're kind of hidden little treasures. Um, you can find them; they're not hard to find. You could probably get them used on Amazon in paperback for ten bucks or twelve bucks. But they're just filled with, their, with the mother's discussions about evolution, reality, uh, the living in the ashram, health, illness, sickness, is everything, every aspect of life. So, if someone's interested, we can maybe put links to that and something in the things or. Yeah, if you have links to that, send it to sure, me. Sure, absolutely. Include yeah. it in the um, YouTube and in the blog. But the mother was just a beautiful expression of cosmic shakti in the flesh, and how it, it can come from anywhere, and 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 that it still is connected. It's really, and, it, and also it's beautiful to see that the one of the main texts, which kind of was the catalyst for her huge transformation, was the Bhagavad Gita which I think is, I always thought that was beautiful. Hmm. Hmm. Now, uh, I had some readings that I was looking at and some links that were sent to me while I was trying to wrap my head around how I wanted to put all of this information together and what questions I wanted to ask. But in some of the readings, it was indicating that Mira, or the mother, was influenced by one of her teachers, Theon. Max Theon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you yes. tell me more about that? Yeah. yeah. Max, Max Theon was a hugely influential esoteric figure behind the scenes. Um, and, and, and as I've often said, you know, Mira was taught by a demon. And I think that we can see, to me, the mother's relationship to Max Theon and Max Theon's wife is very, it's almost like a, an embodiment, a cosmic ex expression of the ideas in Jyotish of the demons in the relationship to the planet Venus. 
and how the, the how the demons and the, there's a relationship between Vedic teachers and Venus and also the planet Venus was the planet of the demons and, and teaching the demons, but teaching the demons the Dharma. And that, and, that, and that often demons were better at doing the Dharma than the other people because they were more focused and they were, they were, they were dedicated. They weren't lazy. So, you know, of course we see there's very important, meta, you know, metaphysical teachings in there, but that's kind of what was happening with her. He was teaching her really radical occult techniques. Um, and of course there was some influence of theosophy in there, but he influenced theosophy. He was kind of a radical in that. Uh, and he was definitely, um, you know, tapping into, a deeper, darker aspect of the occult tradition, but also helping her transform, you know? And so she was able to, it's almost like she was able to go to this mysterious kind of dark figure, learn some things and then become transformed and leave and, and flower. For her you know, own so divinization. For her, yeah. For her own divinization. And I thought that was, I think that's just such a, you can't even make that up. It's just, once again, it's like a, a beautiful expression of this cosmic story of someone going to a Naga for teachings and then coming out and becoming a saint, you know, or going to, we see that in Buddhism too, that, you know, the demon would be smarter than the, the priest or something like that, or, uh, you well, know, and, wild, it, you know. and it goes back to that churning of the ocean, you yes, know, you had to yes. have both sides to churn it, not yes, just one that, side churned it. Yeah. I think that that Vedic image of the churning of the oceans, I just go back to over and over and over again. And we can really see that even in Mira's life. Um, from Mira to the mother. That's why I often say, you know, I always wanted to write an essay called From Mira to the Mother. And then you can, you can just see the beautiful transformation, the trajectory of that transformation. And, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, 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 the cleanliness of the intent was more important than the cleanliness of the actions. And so that was the same thing too. The mother had pure intentions. And so she was able to always take what she needed from Max Theon, and then if there was ever a point where she said, ah, oh, that's not what I need, she would clearly stand her ground, and, and she had the power to do that, and they acknowledged that. They knew that, you know. Interesting. Uh, one of the other things um, that I was reading about the mother is it said she could ex exteriorize herself 12 times up to the upper limit of manifestation in a trance, Yet yes. talk, which was a technique taught to her by Theon. Yeah, and Theon. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? Yeah, Theon taught her a lot of occult techniques um, that she went would continue to use within the Aurobindo system, within the yogic system. Um, and many of those techniques are things that you know we see mentioned in the third pada of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's just very mystical teachings from the East about. Uh, you know, using different ways for the for the body to for the consciousness to leave the body transform um, and so she was was doing all that was aware of that and they were still using all that um, and she was quite you know when you look at her teachings and her writings and her letters she was very open about that you know she that wasn't hidden um, although some things were hidden more but that's kind of why I always like to look at Sat Prem's writing her student because he revealed a lot of things that were going on um, behind the scenes that were quite mysterious. Um, and, and then that's also to she and her discussions about her ability to do these esoteric mysterious things. She was very clear about talking about when she saw um, the descent of Krishna into Aurobindo's body. And she was very clear about that. And that's something I talk about a, a quite a bit because it's shocking how many people who even people who study Aurobindo were not aware of that. They would be, they, they were not aware that Aurobindo was literal. Aurobindo's work, Aurobindo's life, uh, was literally a type of an expression of an, a type of an incarnation of Krishna again. And the mother was very clear about her being able to see this. There was you know oh he's partly inside him. Now he's completely inside him. Now I see him completely going into every cell of his body. She was very clear about that how that was happening you know, in, in an evolutionary pattern. It wasn't just like one day, bam, it was there. The mother was like, no, I see this happening before my very eyes. Um, and that's probably when toward the end when he did go into the seclusion, that's when she said it was a complete integration into his being. So we can even look at that, like his life uh, is, is like an, another expression of Krishna seeking to come down, seeking to completely immerse the con itself in a consciousness of humanity 
with all the pain and suffering, experience all of that to allow people to grow closer to a love for him and his love for humanity. So it's very, very beautiful. You know, and you talked about how she wasn't always real forthcoming about her techniques. Yes, yes. And, and like, why? You know, I, I, I often think to myself, how come we can't just freely talk about yeah. techniques? And, you know, sometimes I think that people have a lot of fear about sharing some of these things. They think it might be woo-woo or they think yep, that it yep. might be um, judged as something negative or evil type of concepts. Yeah, I agree. I think the mother, I think the, the main reason why the mother was so secretive especially toward the end was because they, they inter had a very interesting experience at Auroville with their kind of attempted creation of a community. And the more that, the more the responsibility of creating that community became aware, the more she saw the limitations of her ability to publicly talk about these things because the more and more people were coming in that had no experience, no clue about what was going on, a lot of emotional baggage. And then they started, sometimes people were bringing their families there. You know, she was very clear and to say like, these things are not to be discussed around children. Children must be allowed to be raised, but you know, and, and you know, evolves spontaneously, maybe in a yogic culture, but not this stuff doesn't need to be pushed on them right now. And then she would often, you know, feel, you can see this in her writings, like the, the volumes of her books about like the, her lectures and people would be asking her, you know, just really basic questions. Like, you know, I, I, I'm so upset. I'm depressed about my relationship or I'm depressed about my life. And so then she could, she started to see like, oh, okay, this isn't some this, these ideas aren't, people aren't going to be able to understand all of this. And, and like, and you nailed it. It's, I think the mother saw that some, a lot of people just weren't physically and psychologically ready to contain that. And it, if that was brought down to them at that point, they would, they, their whole nervous system would fry out or their whole, their emotional system would fry out. So I think she, I think toward the end of her life as, and as she evolved and as their relationship with the Orobindo and started, as he went into seclusion, they, their vision became so much more serious about what the reality of their limitations were. And at that point, I think they probably saw, well, we need to be, we need to get as much down in paper as we can. We need to get as much down to at least, you know, have a, have a memory of all this. And then I think probably for sure, our and the mother, they, they, they had such a grander vision, right? Of like, okay, well, we did the most we can do in this lifetime. Now we're going to work into another dimension and start working there. And so I think at that point they were probably like, okay, we've really pushed the envelope of what we can do here. Now we have to move into another dimension and continue to work on the earth plane, but in a different way. And so I think that's kind of where they were, you know, toward the end with that. Um, and then, so they became a little bit more private, you know, about that. Interesting. But it's all there. You know, if you, if you get her letters and you get her works, you can still find, you know, a lot of this, all the stuff that the ideas and things you just have to be, um, dedicated adventure <laughs> to go all to, to go through all the books and, you know, you know, if it, I was looking at some of the notes that I took earlier because I wasn't really 100% sure what all I was going to ask. But one of the things that I had seen written and I quoted it, it said, I could say the cells of the body have to learn to seek their support only in the divine yes. until they are able to feel that they are an expression of the divine. And I thought, Oh, that's so beautiful. That, that the, the body has to learn to seek support of the, div the divine until the cells of the body. Literally. Yeah. And, and that we can see that that's a really beautiful kind of scientific expression of the, the, the different kind of the spectrum of bhakti, the, the waves of devotion, all the different, we, in Vaishnava systems often talk about like there's different taste rasas of bhakti as the taste of bhakti get more and more pure that's kind of what she was talking about like the deeper levels the most esoteric levels of bhakti is when we're starting to see literal transformations on the cellular level 
the, the person is kind of constantly living in that state, not just occasionally. Mm. But we have to start, right? It's, it's, a, it's a process. Like you have to, it's not like you can just instantly get there. Some people, based on their karma, will be instantly there. Some people might be there based on their karma in five years of sadhana. You know, some people might be 10 years of sadhana, but some people might be 10 lifetimes, but they're starting to already feel it, right? They can sense it. They want something. They, they kind of see the flame far away, and so they're starting to go toward it. And um, then that's kind of the process of the evolution with that too, but that's kind of what should, needs to happen eventually, that every aspect of your being is living in some type of God intoxicated saint and, and everything becomes spontaneously. And, you know, we're so used to talking about, I'm so glad you used that verse because we're so used to talking about these spiritual things like intellectually or kind of symbolically, but Aurobindo and the mother were saying, no, f literally physiologically, this is going to change you. Uh, which is why I often, when I was studying Aurobindo growing up, it was like, and I was studying Ayurveda, it was like, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> There's so many Ayurvedic things in this about the, you know, literally the, the, the intelligence of the body, the, the cellular intelligence, that intelligence too had its own sadhana, that intelligence too had its own tapas. And so that we had to kind of start to transform that as well too. So it's, it's really beautiful way of expressing what, true spiritual transformation means or or without a doubt what true alchemy means yeah yeah it's a true it's hand his work is a handbook of alchemy and her work as well you know and you were referring to bhakti and talking about the cellular change and it reminds me of how we you know are taught in certain lineages to chant until you the chant is just resonating in every cell of you. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's similar to like Dr. Emoto's water experiment. Yes, that most people totally. are familiar yep. with. Yep. And that when you're constantly chanting a japa japa in your mind, that you become what you are aspiring to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. It's a very important thing to express that, that, it just, you, you literally start to have a resonance of that. And when they talk about the, the Shakti of the mantra awakening, what, you know, when we work with a mantra, when the Shakti of the mantra does, the mantra Shakti does awaken, it's awakening on a cellular level. That, that resonance is starting to happen on a cellular level. At first, it might be a resonance on an auric level, uh, on a visual level on a temporary emotional level, but as we continue on, it starts to deepen and it penetrates. It, it penetrates deep into the aspects of our body um, and then and down to the cellular level. And that's when we can get into discussions about the, the alchemy and Ayurvedic alchemy. What does Soma really mean? You know, what, what, what does that really mean from a yogic perspective? It's not just some kind of mushroom that, 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 they were, that the rishis were taking, what, or even what is a rishi? <laughs> what does that really mean <laughs> to be a seer of consciousness? And that was a, a type of being that every cell of their body was, was resonating this in the flesh. And they were able to travel at cosmic distances and see things and do things. And we think, oh, that sounds like science fiction today. But it's not. It's not science fiction at all. It's, it's basically a, a yogic science that our modern mind just can't comprehend. Um, well, we can comprehend it, but what we've done in the, in, the, in the modern age is we've taken all of those ideas and said only technology can do that. You know, and I refer to that as the, in my, in Earning the Desert, as the techno god. It's like we've taken all of the potential for evolution out of humanity and we've put it into technology. And so we, so we, can, we can assume that. We can assume like, oh, my iPhone's going to continue to update. Oh, my computer's going to update. Boy, I sure can't wait till I have a better iPhone. I sure can't wait till my car's better. Oh, and now I'm going to have a smart car. Now one day we won't even have to drive. But so we can we can infinitely kind of imagine that. But then people stop thinking that they can evolve. They right. stop thinking that humanity can can evolve. They stop thinking that the flesh can evolve. And I think that's a danger. That's an historic danger, right there. Well, and I think that was one of the main reasons why I was attracted to this particular subject mm -hmm. is because, mm -hmm. you know, we think, oh, okay, you know, I finished school, I finished college, maybe, 
Um, I've read some books, I've lived some life experiences, but I don't think that people realize that they're actually capable of a conscious evolution right? because they don't know what it looks like. Totally. Totally. You nailed it. That's beautifully said. And I think that's a responsibility to study these traditions, to discuss these traditions, to continue to kind of express these traditions because people need a roadmap. They need at least a vision or discussion of that so that you can show them, Hey, there's, there's a possibility here. Well, and I also think that, you know, sometimes we look at people like Triado Bindo and we think, Oh, wow. You know, I'm never going to reach that level. Right. And, yeah. and these, these, you know, gurus and things like this seem out of reach or unattainable yes. or, you know, really fantastic. And I think that one of the things I was thinking about yesterday was the concept of subjective synthesis. And yes. if we don't believe that it's attainable, then it's not attainable. Totally. In many ways. But if we so see important. other people lead that example and actually manifest it in, in what I would consider manifesting divinity within the mundane, yes. then people would begin to realize, oh my goodness, I can do that too. Yes. It's, it's so important. And I think that that's why we have to talk about these things and discuss that because um, people need examples um, down from the highest, you know, reshik level of consciousness uh, to practitioners who do kind of a rishi level of yoga, but that should also filter down into every aspect of life. And then especially if we talk about the divination of life, then what happens then is then you start to see every part of life as sacred potential that you can transform every part of your life. And when you start to do that, that's how, this, that's how the transformation starts. You start to transform the small things and the small things start to add up to larger things over time. So that's beautifully said. We have, always have to remember that we're all starting where we are. We're all a work in progress, um, but we have to start. <laughs> we have to do it. You know, Krishna says that even I'll take the most simplest offering even just a flower, I'll accept that as beautiful devotion for me. It's, it's just as pure as a Rishi doing a Vedic Yajna for me, but, but it has to be done, but you still have to do it. <laughs> it has to be doing. So I think that's the thing is we, some people, we just have to tell them like anything you do is a, is, is a good thing to do, but you still have to do it. You still have to get out there and try. Yeah. And you know, on that same subject, I think that sometimes different traditions seem so complicated and intimidating yeah yeah that people I think so don't too. know where to start. I yeah. had somebody I was talking to the other day, and the gentleman was saying some things about complicated procedures, and I said, "Maybe just go sing to the flowers." Yeah. yeah. And he probably thought I was just being flippant, but I meant it. No, you know, that's just, true. Go sing to the flowers, go appreciate yeah. something, go be content, go be showing gratitude. That's very important. Um, because I think not everybody necessarily needs to, you know, devote themselves to a lifetime of study of Aurobindo per se, if they, unless they feel a calling. You know, that's it's all about what you feel, what you feel called to, um, and then to follow that and to kind of follow your dharma. That's once again just like the Bhagavad Gita. It's it's better to fail at your own dharma than to succeed at someone else's dharma. You know, it's like you're, so it's better to try your own path and fail than to live an inauthentic life. So we always, you know, that's a key idea. Very important. So did Sri Aurobindo, was his writings on integral yoga, would you say that they're pretty similar to what we typically find, like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras in the, did he have like an outline of a stepwise process to reach this super mental level? He did. He did it, but it was, but he definitely did, you know, synthesize a lot of these traditions. You know, he wrote extensively on the Upanishads. He wrote an extremely important book on Agni, an extremely important book on the Vedas, the secret of the Veda. Um, his book, The Secret of the Veda, was probably the most influential book on my entire life um, and kind of guided my entire life next to Savitri. Um, but he also wrote really basic books about, you know, the, the importance of sleep and the importance of 
of yoga, the, the different steps of yoga. So yes, his, 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 in a voluminous body of work, it's filled with tools and keys and connections and ideas. And then, you know, as it evolves, he'll often start to show, well, you know, this was, for example, this was Patanjali's yoga, but now my integral yoga is doing this. So he would always compare and contrast and kind of show that, yes, this was a part of the evolution, but this new vision is something different. But it, yeah, you could, students could pick any parts of his work and they're, they're going to find ample tools, ample roadmaps for that as well, without a doubt. So they did, they definitely gave people a lot of tools and ideas to study then. And uh, the mother did as well. And I was curious, um, cause I was reading some other things on the thought fuzz recently. Did he incorporate or did the mother incorporate, you know, this concept of the tattvas and this concept of supramental consciousness moving, you know, through the veils of Maya and, you know, starting from the earth element and going up to the water, the air, et cetera, and then through the sense organs and the janendriyas did they relate it to the tathvas and that ascent up and down? Yeah, I think uh, in my library here. Yeah, so he has the, um, they're quite big. They're these like encyclopedic books called his records of yoga. And they're just massive journal entries of all his experiences with the tathvas, of all his experiences with mantras of all his levels of working with the pranas, shakti. Um, and I mean, it's like voluminous. It looks like a phone book. And this is, this is volume one. And so he, his, he, has, he has huge amounts of writings about all of that. So it's, his resources um, for those kind of informations are just massive and huge. Um, and, and if anyone has any, you know, if, if people who listen to this podcast you know, really feel called to study Aurobindo, then they can obviously contact you or me and we can guide them to particular books to start with. There's a lot of great resources and there's, there's even like really some beautiful study guides. Um, even, even Savitri, which is a beautiful poem is very dense. Um, and it has uh, wonderful study guides that you can buy that will kind of take you through step by step to understand different things. Um, you know, as my background in English literature and poetry, it was a little bit easier for me to, to penetrate, right? So, that, so I came from that background and then into that Vedic view because the Vedic, uh, is, the Vedic view is a very Upanishadic view of reality, which is a very poetic view of reality. And so that, I think the contemporary mind has a little bit of trouble with that. Um, they're not thinking in a poetic way. Um, but Aurobindo is this beautiful kind of syncret, syncretic poetic versus scientific viewpoint and they're kind of they're kind of going back and forth so any no matter where anyone enters that there's usually a resource for them there study guides access to study that as well too nice well let me take a look here i'd put together tons of notes and towards the end the notes just kind of went into a <laughs> pile of questions and then I was like I'm just going to leave everything there in case I have a question sure sure um and does anybody at home have any questions if you yeah, feel do, free to go jump ahead in. and type it into the chat right now and we'll have some time here at the end for question and answer if you have any questions um so this was something that I was reading at the same time and I thought, I'm not sure if I'm going to toss this in there as something comparative, but when I'm reading, a lot of times I'll pick up multiple books. And in your book, Cult of Golgotha, in page 181, um, there was reference to the mind-body landscape as a never-ending quantum revelations. Yes. And collapsing waveforms in new mediating spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and you wrote about the fundamental revelation is of the human consciousness as the mediating space between the realm of heaven and hell reflected in the alchemical work between the cerebral and lower chakras. Yes. That's uh, that. And I did, you know, in one, one of the chapters in Golgotha, I cited Aurobindo and Bosa ideas and how that was important. There's a whole chapter in the cult of Golgotha on my 
how Arbindo has influenced both my occult work versus my just pure tantric physics work. A lot of people get confused about that. They're all the same expression, um, but, I, but I'm just linguistically breaking them up so people can understand them. Um, just, like, just like reality is all different bubbles on the ocean of Vishnu. They're all just public expressions of that. But that is the, that is the case that these, the body and the, the awareness and the, the ability of the supermental consciousness to descend depending on one's level of awareness is a type of waveform collapse, essentially, from a quantum perspective. That, that it, it, it's always existing. It's always existing, but we just can't access it. And then as we see periodic psychological, emotional, and physical transformations, and then particularly the combination of all those together, we can have a waveform collapse, and then we'll have a vision. We'll have a clairaudient experience, a clairvoyant experience, uh, a, 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 you know, a communication with the deity, Ishvara Pranidhana, which is kind of, we have that vision, you know, it happens. And that's a waveform, that's like a waveform collapse. And then, then, it, then it can it kind of go back out depending on how long we can hold that, right? It's, it's hard to sustain those in different levels of reality. It's, it becomes much easier to, to sustain those typically in, in two ways. You can, you can sustain that if you're living in a more natural environment. And by more natural environment, I mean literally in nature. You know, if you're living in the forest, if you're living in the Himalayas, if you're living, if you're if you're at Mount Kailas, if you're at Lake Manasarovar, or if you're in Vrindavana, then the whole resonance of that place is so powerful that those waveforms can collapse and sustain themselves for much longer. Um, and then number two, the other aspect is that just the the light, the the length of one sadhana and the intensity of one sadhana and the intention, as that starts to become stronger, it builds up into a critical mass. And then you can sustain those waveforms longer in different ways. But that's essentially what that was. I was seeking kind of to describe that in Golgotha, this idea that, that these levels of consciousness are kind of morphing in and out of different levels of reality. Um, uh, both the lower chakras, of course, are, are, in, are kind of indicative of this physical reality. And then even deeper, more esoteric aspects of the physical reality. And as, as we ascend, then it becomes a little bit more etheric on that level. Yeah. And when I was reading it, I was relating it to this whole concept of, you know, moving up and moving down and moving up and moving yes. down. Like, oh, this can be really confusing for people. Yes. You know, where do you start? Or, or like, if you just look at the Panchakoshas, if you pull up yes. a Google image of the Panchakoshas, some of them are, you know, Anamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha, and outward to the Vijnanamaya Kosha. And then other ones, the diagram is flipped the other way. Exactly. Where the Anamaya Kosha is outer and the more attainable, you know, the higher attainable, quote unquote, koshas are more interior. And I yes. thought, this is confusing for people. It's very hard and it's very confusing. So if you have that flux that's constantly going on, a lot of people just can't sustain that or their, their mind, their consciousness is not ability to, to hold that. And so to be able to hold that, that's what, that's kind of the whole point of our esoteric work, the whole point of yoga, the whole point of yoga psychology is to start understanding those different aspects of the mind. The whole point of Ayurveda uh, and the purification, the doshas, all that. To tie. I'll have a whole chapter on the, the new tantric physics book called Ayurvedic Alchemy, which talks about that because it is a type of alchemy to be able to sustain that. And um, it's just not something that something normal people can do. It's very, it's very similar to, um, you know, if one practices martial arts for a long, long time, the, the, the mind states become easier. It's easier for you to become calm in stressful situations spontaneously. Your body just starts to react before you even think about that. Yeah. But, but that, that comes over time, right? You're like, oh, that must be so magical. And, it, and the person's like, not really. I've just been doing this for so long that I start to embody it. And so sodden is like that as well, too. Uh, just, you know, it comes over time. You know, and that I'm brings sorry. it all back down to tapas and doing your austerities and your, you know, that true discipline to, to the point where it's like Pavlov's response. You just, exactly. think, you just think of the act of doing your sadhana and it 
drops you right into it. And then, totally. you know, we talked earlier about bhakti and just being in that state of constant bhakti, everything, looking for the sacredness in everything and everyone and every yes. cell. And that whole concept you talk about sacramental vision and just constantly having that awareness it, so that you're a perpetual envelope for that sacralization. Exactly. Perfectly said. I 100% agree. And I, I think that people really get distracted by life and distracted by all of the different things they have to attain and learn. Yes. And I don't know, from my, my perspective, yeah, you know, I've studied many things, but for me, it has to be experienced to tr truly understand it. Yes. And I think that when you try to explain to people experiences, it sounds so woo woo. And I think yeah. where people get kind of mixed up on where should they start their practice and how should they even think about a attempting to come into a state of super mentalization. <laughs> totally. Say it right. Yeah, yeah. No, you that's what very well said. It's 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 a process. It takes time and it's just basically how however long someone is going to stay um a part of it. Yeah. And then you get the whole intellectual community, which I think is critical and necessary. But if you can't articulate it or you can't describe it, you're kind of bashed as a childish or uninformed person. And I think that that's a really sad thing that I find in the community is people genuinely want to create their own practices and their own understanding in a unique way that makes sense to them. But if they're not able to articulate it, express it, or quote it and cite it, then they're they're made to look like they're dumb or yes. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a big, that's a very important point. And I think, I think, you know, we, a lot of these things does bring up the importance of experience and education. Like we always have to understand that a lot of these things that we're trying to do with our spiritual transformation, we just have to learn a lot. We start to have to study more, but then we have to put all that into practice. And then we have to kind of watch that and keep aware of that. So I think a lot of people, they're either not reading us enough or they're just only reading. They're not putting it into practice. Um, so it's a little bit of both um, that to literally start to do some work, actually do the work, experience it, uh, and then come back and study more, experience it, do more. And that's kind of what I always say about a sadness, like the people actually have to do something. Um, and then, you know, good teachers, like we see this in martial arts, good teachers can tell good students because the good students have the best questions because they're actually trying. They can tell when someone's not trying. You know, if someone, uh, we could use a book metaphor. If, if everyone was reading a Faulkner book or, you know, a book um, by Lawrence Durrell, and, then, and if they really read it, they would probably have a lot of questions. If someone who didn't kind of really read it, they'd be like, whatever, they wouldn't have any questions. So we have to actually dive in and do the experience. And when we do that, oftentimes, if we have a true experience, then we, even, though, even though we might not be able to express it perfectly, we can quickly adapt and learn and then and jump in and, and fit that in a different way. So I think that's a, it's all about you know, doing the work and studying and a constant kind of alchemy of both those together. Did and having, having faith, just having faith. Now, I know that Sri Aurobindo, you said, had huge volumes of writings. Yeah. And do you think that, now this is just a personal question, do you think that he would have recommended more for people to write down their experiences, go back and reread what they've experienced for their own purpose of creating this new awakening within themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the things, it's a great question. And I think that's why when we see now, when we, like when we look at the, the mother's agenda journals, his voluminous records of yoga, you know, he kept records of all this. And so that's kind of like basically his magical journals, her magical journals, and they could go back 
um, and look at them. And that is such an important thing um, to do. It's so important. Um, I see a question here says, what was the name of the mother's journals are called the mother's agenda. Um, and it, it'll easily be the mother's agenda, volume one, mother's agenda, volume two. And you could definitely find them on Amazon. Probably a, a ton of independent publishers have the used, used copies. You know, they're all around. Um, and you don't necessarily have to start with volume one. The volume one, volume two, those are just based on years. But you could jump in in any, any way. It's not like a, this like systematic. It's like journals. It's like journals. Like if you had your journals, you could open up your journals to any page and probably get something from it. But if you looked at the dates, you'd be like, oh, okay, this was the year before this happened, or this was the year after that happened. Okay, that gives me a little bit more perspective on what's going on. But, it, but you could still get something out of it no matter what page you turned on to. But yeah, they were, they were very important, um, in, or it was very important for them to keep records and to systematically look at them. It's, I think that's a very important thing to do. Yeah, I, I think about a year, year and a half ago, somebody recommended to me that I keep a journal of everything yeah. that I'm working on, reading on, but more importantly, anything that really interesting would happen that maybe the mind would dismiss a day later or a week later as, yeah. oh, you know, that was kind of like woo woo. And now that I start looking back at those journal entries, I realize that there really has been change and opening. I mean, we're always changing and opening, but I think that when you write it down and then yes. you look back, you really see. Yeah, you really see it. And you start to see that you have your own personal trajectory. And then you, you have your own personal evolution, your own personal history. And that's very important for people to do that. And then I, I refer to going back over your journals and going back over your personal history as a type of, I call it Gnostic nostalgia that you can go back and you can look at past things that you've done and written and past experiences and start to see how they were catalyst and keys to your present transformation. And the also they, they can provide very mysterious doorways to a type of almost esoteric time, time travel back to those states of consciousness, which you can still extract from and still feed the present which get, that's getting a little bit esoteric, but that, that's kind of what I refer to Gnostic nostalgia. And I'll, I'll have that in another book soon. I'll probably write more about that on my blog. Uh, so I saw a question. Someone asked me is, was the mother's agenda by Sat Prem? Yes, it's by Sat Prem. Sat Prem was the, the he collect, collected all those together and any writings uh, by Sat Prem. Um, I highly recommend phenomenal writings. Mm, interesting. Those will be new to me. I'm always looking for new stuff. I'm always yeah, you'll on. Love, you'll, you'll love Sat Prem. His writings are, uh, when you read it, you're like, why has, have I not read this before? Why is this not out there? It's just these secrets just hidden on the shelves. Aurobindo's work, the mother's work, their students are just like priceless gems sitting in an antique store on the shelf, just waiting for someone to take them off and to change their life. And is he easier to read than Sri yes. Aurobindo? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can easily access it. I mean, he's very intellectual and very smart, but definitely um, can be extremely helpful in understanding the Aurobindo system, the Aurobindo tradition. And then you can actively see like, oh, this was a direct student of the mother. Wow, this really affected them. This is what they did with it. It's like, oh, okay, wow. What, what can I do with it? It's, it's really good mm. to see that. Mm. And what would the end goal be, let's say, of super mentalization? I think that the end goal would be to have a complete transformation of all levels of physical reality and social reality and personal reality, where everyone is taking an active participation in spiritual evolution. Um, and that's the ultimate goal of Aurobindo's work was that we could be empowered, live an empowered life in harmony with nature, in harmony with everyone else, and in harmony with the cosmic evolutionary pattern. And when that happened, we were kind of participating in that kind of tug of war, that Gnostic tug of war between the Asuras and the Devas to help this mysterious expression of consciousness, in our, which is our universe, which is all planes of reality. And every, you know, we have to remember that every plane of reality is participating in this yeah. every it's fascinating every planet and their planes of reality are participating in this 
every dimension is participating in this, and so, which is very beautiful and extremely mysterious when we think about that. So it's, it's, a, it's a big cosmic play. <laughs> now, this might be an odd question, but it's the last question that I want to ask. Do you think, or what do you think Sri Aurobindo would, or the mother, either of them, would say in relationship to our current state of adaptation? I think they would be, I think Aurobindo and the mother would be particularly concerned with our dependence and obsession with technology and that, and that we, that we should really start to invest in using the technology to help people instead of having the technology use us. And so I think that would be a big thing that they would be interested in now would be like, okay, we have these tools, but how, what's the best way we can use them? You know, what's the best way we can use this technology to help all of humanity? And because they would definitely see it as a, as a facet of the evolution, you know, like, wow, if we can do this with that, um, what can we do with something else? So looks like someone just posted a question on there. Yeah, the question is, you were talking earlier about purity of intent. Are you talking about intent in what you're doing in spiritual practices? Uh, intent in everything from a t from a, like from I speak from an agoric and a tantric perspective in the sense that our intent in every act and reality everything we do in the flesh everything we do mentally uh, whatever our intent is is more important than the actual expression of the actions um, and so that, and that takes us of course outside of like rigid rules rigid fundamentalism religion you know rigid suppression of anybody and anything based on random social, political, moralistic beliefs, that, that the intentions should be free from that. If that makes sense. It does. Hopefully, okay. Was there any other questions on there? So we'll give a last opportunity if you have any questions. So, someone said one more. Okay, good. Yeah, feel free to type it in. So this last question is, you said if you're not ready to ascend, you can move into becoming a megalomania. How do you know if you're ready? I think that's a pretty common question. How do you know if yeah. you're ready for you know, this new energetic shift? Yeah, they used to say, uh, even in some of you know, Aleister Crowley's writings, when they would talk about crossing the abyss, they would say, you, know, you would know you were ready if you were not afraid of death, on any level and you were not afraid of losing your 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 personal expression of who you were so if someone was still so tied into who they were on every level on a on a mundane personality level they couldn't you know couldn't withstand change then they probably weren't ready and if they still had deep seated fears of death then they probably weren't ready and that, that that's you know that's abhinavesha right that's like a deep seated fear so that's something that is like kind of programmed into the body. So we're always going to have a little bit of fear. That's the human body trying to stay alive. That's, that's normal. But I think knowing whether you're ready or not, usually is that's when you, that's the importance of having a dependable teacher or a dependable advisor or a system. Once again, we're back to that. Like that's the reason why the system, the teacher, the advisors are so important that you can go to and ask them, do you think I'm ready? Um, because a lot of times, you know, we're, we're very ready, but we don't do it. And, and at other times people are not ready and they're, they go do it. <laughs> you know, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? The, the, the people who are less intelligent usually think they're the more intelligent ones and the smarter ones usually think they're the dumber ones. And, and so we, you know, that's the you know, ideal. A good teacher will tell you like, you can do this. You're ready to do this. Even when you don't believe it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the best answer I can give for that is that once again, that's the reason for the importance of the advisor, the, the, the mentor, the teacher, the system, whatever you want to phrase it, you know, you know, whether we say guru, advisor, teacher, coach, mentor, you know, that's really important to have that at that point, because it's, it, it is very hard to tell, 
because the other because I'll give you an honest answer because if you don't have that if you do not have a system you don't have a sampradaya you don't have a parampara you don't have a teacher you don't have a mentor and you and you you can still do it but if you do it and you're not ready your life will never be the same again it's like it's like you know are you ready to jump across across that mountain sure you can try what happens if i don't ready well then you you'll die you're just going to that's it. so you, so if you take if you want to take that gamble without having any advisors, any teachers, anything, then, you know, enter at your own risk um, with those kind of things. It becomes very serious at that point. You know, every move becomes very serious because there can be very serious implications from that on psychological, emotional levels. Uh, of course, you know, this lifetime is one in an infinite expression, but it's still very important, <laughs> you know? And so that's, so that's what I would say to that is like, if you, if you're not sure you're ready, and you don't have a teacher, probably don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. I remember recently I was communicating with somebody and I said, maybe I'll just swim in the shallow end. Yeah. When I yeah. realized maybe I was already in the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You're like, oh, wow. Okay. I, you're right. I didn't realize I was here, you know, and it happens. So that, that, that yeah. can be, and that can be scary. So yeah, it can be. Well, thank you very much, Craig, again, for a wonderful conversation. Oh, it's been and wonderful. Thanks for having me on. I'll um, look forward to the next conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, thank everyone, you, everybody, for joining yeah, thanks, us. Thanks, everybody, for coming on. Namaste.